when readings indicated potentially higher levels of radiation. This turned out to be a false alarm caused by a computation error. There was no radiological release. While there are concerns related to what happened this week, there's certainly a bright side to this in that it shows that WIP is being as careful and cautious as possible. We ultimately cannot fault the facility for being extra safe. We encourage WIP to continue to make extensive efforts to inform the community both through social media and through traditional methods such as phone calls and press release. A much higher concern is the recent announcement that WIP is running significantly behind schedule and will not meet the deadline announced by Secretary Moniz during his visit to Carlsbad. The eyes of the entire world are on this facility right now. Announcing a deadline and then not meeting it is harmful to the cr critical mission of cleaning up the nation's transuranic waste. We certainly recognize that some of these delays are due to safety concerns and respect the need for caution in these occurrences. But it would not be fair to say that the entire delay is due to safety. There were also delays caused by additional human error and by poorly developed procedural overlaps. We need to make safety a result, not an excuse and reduce mistakes. The citizens of this community strongly support WIP and it is because of this support that we have high expectations. For many years, WIP was proudly the Department of Energy's success story while other locations struggled year after year and never got off the ground. This facility right here in southeastern New Mexico was effective and operational, and we must get back to that. Kim. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'll be filling in for John Heaton this week. Um, I want to mention, you know, under normal circumstances, we always, or John always asks that, that we hold questions till the end. But since we're going to be covering a, a number of different issues tonight, uh, we're going to go ahead and break uh, break between segments and go ahead and take questions. And um, the mayor almost also in, uh, mentioned uh, our EOC uh, activation earlier this week, and that's what we're going to kick it off with with uh, Mr. Blankenhorn. Great, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, what I wanted to do was just uh, go back through with everybody the events that occurred uh, Tuesday, uh, August 4th, and, uh, and let you know, uh, as the mayor indicated, some of the good things that, uh, that came out of that activation and, uh, and some of the lessons learned that uh, we're going to continue to factor in in terms of continuous improvement for our programs. But uh, at about 6 o'clock uh, in the evening uh, last Tuesday, August 4th, uh, we, our radiological control technicians, were out doing uh, surveys, required surveys of our, of our monitoring stations. And the Station B sampler, which is downstream of our filtered uh, systems, uh, the exhaust from the underground, uh, they detected uh, what they believed to be uh, readings that were about twice the background levels. Our procedures require them to immediately notify uh, the facility management, and then the facility management then goes through uh, their procedure sets and, uh, and take immediate actions, number one, and then they start, uh, start response operations and then, and then move into recovery operations. So uh, as a result of the notification, uh, the facility shift manager went through his classification and categorization procedures. He did that in a very timely manner. Uh, he then started... Uh, down through the immediate actions, which included uh, notifying the site personnel to shelter in place and also for the underground personnel to, to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures. All that was done in a very orderly and, and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we activated uh, and took the Emergency Operations Center in town, the new one. Personnel to, to move to their assembly areas it, it and begin accountability procedures. 5 p.m. 
all that was done in a very orderly and, and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we activated uh, and took the Emergency Operations Center in town, the new personnel, to, to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures. All that was done in a very orderly and Discipline manner. Uh, at about 7:45 p.m., we then started. We activated uh, and took the emergency operations center in town, the new personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures. p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7:45 p.m., we then started. We activated uh, and took the emergency operations center in town, the new personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center uh, in town and moved personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures. p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated operations center in town and moving personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. At uh, about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center in town and moving personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center uh, in town and moved personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center uh, in town and moved personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center uh, in town and moved personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated operations center in town and moving personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center in town and moving personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center uh, in town and moved personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin accountability procedures at 5 p.m. All that was done in a very orderly and disciplined manner. Uh, at about 7.45 p.m., we then started activated uh, and took the emergency operations center uh, in town and moved personnel to move to their assembly areas and begin
institute, um, while we're doing all these immediate actions, institute a second peer verification to ensure uh, accuracy. Better institute, uh, but overall, I think the uh, facility response and recovery was uh, well done. Second peer so, verification. Uh, so on Tuesday, and just to reiterate, about 7:35 p.m. Better, but overall, I think there was no response, no event, no rate loss, no detonation. Second, we exited from the event activation. Just to reiterate, about 7:35 p.m. Questions on on this specifically before we go into some of the other parts of our. We'll go ahead and take the questions for folks here before we go to the um, with the false calculation, shouldn't you have had cam monitors to we'll survey that area? And if so, folks here before we go to why not? They're right away to be there. That way, yeah. bad math caused a false alarm. So, um, what we have, you're right. Normally, we have um, systems in place at both Station A and Station B. In this particular case, the the system at Station B was out of service, and so our procedures and protocols um, account for that. And, and have a manual system where, where we send out the radiological control technicians on uh, a minimum of every four hours to manually frisk the filters and then do the calculations. Um, and that's, that's the way our process is laid out. We've got that redundancy built into the program. Now, you know, we, as, as we look at this, though, it's, it's a single data point, and and while there were many people that didn't, did not believe that we had a release as a result because it was a beta only emitter, um, we, didn't, we did not ask them to look at the totality of, of all the other detectors. So as I mentioned, the station A, which is in front of station B, detected nothing and it was online and serviceable. The instrumentation in the underground was all serviceable and that's what you would have expected, would have seen a release first they weren't detecting anything. But, but even with all that, we still wanted to treat this, this alarm as an actual alarm. Um, and so that's, that's the process we the follow. Instrumentation in the underground we was all and that's what, other, what you would have expected other indicators that we had to discredit they detecting the alarm that we got. We wanted but to run through with all that, we still wanted to treat the calculations this, and, this and then alarm alarm physically an go out in the alarm. field and take additional manual surveys to confirm or deny. Any other questions inside? In house? All right, we'll go to the internet. I have two really quick ones that are I can probably group together, and then uh, one that may take a little bit more clarification. Uh, how many people were in the underground when the event started, and could you clarify how long the event lasted again, please? So let me start with the. Um, with a second question, we, we initially got the notification right about um, 6 p.m. It was actually 5.56, I believe. And we terminated from the event at about 11.30, so about five and a half hours from the time we got notification until we terminated from the events. Uh, in terms of how many folks we had in the underground, I, I don't have the exact count. I don't know if anybody in the room does, but we were on a, we were on a back shift operation. So uh, I can get you that number, but it, it would not have been our full complement uh, that we normally would have on a day shift. Uh, but I can I can get you the exact count. Send that back out through the emails. Okay, and then let me go ahead and ask uh, one more. I, I believe this may have been addressed, but it wouldn't hurt to um, refresh it. If there was a calculation error, that was was it a calculation error in the automated software, or was it related to an error a worker made around the time of the alarm? Yeah, the, the error was a was a um, an operator who was doing a calculation, a manual calculation. Uh, he had recorded his readings, and and the calculation required him to take 
his actual reading, uh, and then subtract background. And, and simply put, he just failed to subtract the background. So, so when he moved that value then to the right on, along this calculational table, uh, the number that he moved along was, was much higher than it, it should have been because he didn't subtract that background. So, so I'll give you an example, and these aren't exact numbers. But if he had a reading of about um, uh, 200 or so, and he had a background of about 200, and he didn't subtract that out, you know, he would get 200 at the end versus a zero, which is what, you know, if you'd subtract a 200 from 200. So it was just that simple uh, mathematical calculation. And it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but essentially that's, that was the calculational error. So it resulted in a false high reading, uh, which is a conservative value, but then it did require us to respond. Okay, any, uh, was that it from the internet? That's all I can do. Okay, anybody else? All right, um, I, think, uh, I think we'll uh, go ahead and move, uh, <coughs> move along then. Um, <coughs> Frank Marskowski, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Waste Management, is here from headquarters, and, and uh, uh, Frank is going to address our uh, recovery schedule. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to say that I'm glad to be here for this meeting tonight. Uh, and before I get into talking uh, about where we stand with regard to schedule, uh, I want to make sure that everybody's aware that we had a significant event happen yesterday. Uh, and that was we had an EM1 uh, confirmed by the full Senate yesterday. So we now have stable leadership in the top position at headquarters in Monica Regobuto, who is now the uh, <coughs> Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management. Um, so uh, 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 it, it's been a long time coming. We haven't had one for years. Uh, and now we have uh, uh, at least somebody in that position uh, for the rest of the term. Uh, <coughs> moving on to schedule. Uh, as you probably know, uh, last Friday, uh, we announced that the target date for a resumption uh, of the WIP operations in March of 2016, somebody in that position feasible. Um, we, uh, when we announced the, the um, recovery plan uh, last September, uh, we uh, identified that as the target date, uh, and that was based on the assumption that we believed it could be done safely. Uh, and right now, uh, we don't believe the beginning of the emplacement operations uh, on that date uh, is in, is in uh, anyone's best interest at this point. Uh, since the recovery plan uh, was announced 10 months ago, there's been significant progress at the WIP. Uh, from the, um, uh, from the uh, identification of the hazards underground, uh, the bolting that has occurred, the maintenance activities, uh, the closure of panel six and panel seven, room seven, uh, the uh, whip workers should be commended for all the work that's been done so far. Uh, however, over the past several months, there's been additional activities that we believe needed to be added to the schedule. Uh, some of these are safety-related activities. Uh, and I can't stress enough that the safety of a workplace is a top priority, or workers, workforce is the top priority. Um, there are three primary um, considerations with regard to the, the schedule extension. Uh, the first is, uh, as you all know, the accident investigation report phase two uh, had been uh, issued. It had uh, significant issues uh, that we needed to put corrective actions together for. Uh, these corrective actions, uh, and we're almost completed with, uh, with those, uh, those reports, <coughs> are going to uh, add, add uh, cost and, and time to the schedule uh, because there, uh, there are things that need to be addressed uh, in order for us to move forward. Uh, these, uh, uh, there were 40 judgment and needs that were identified in that report, uh, and this involved both uh, CBFO, NWP, Los Alamos, uh, DOE headquarters, uh, or that, that uh, <coughs> we need to put all these corrective actions together. Uh, and they need to be uh, addressed before we can actually move forward. Uh, last November, uh, there was a new um, 
standard that was put together uh, with regard to safety basis. And so uh, the site is working on a new documented safety analysis uh, uh, report uh, that will address those new requirements. Uh, and actually the WIP facility, when this document is complete, will be the first facility in the DOE complex to have um, a, a documented safety analysis that will comply with the new requirements. And then there were some uh, quality issues that we've had. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about the quality issues that occurred with the, uh, uh, with the uh, interim ventilation system. Uh, the, both the duct work and the fan units that arrived had um, uh, well problems. Uh, there was, um, uh, with regard to the duct work, uh, it wasn't properly secured to the trailer, uh, which caused some additional damage to the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, duct work. Uh, and so uh, they've been working to address those as well, and that's going to push out the schedule. Uh, now I think you know, Jim's going to come up after me and going to talk about where things stand with the interim ventilation system, and I think he has some, uh, some good news to, to report uh, in that regard. Uh, in addition to those, there's been other infrastructure and some uh, equipment failures uh, that caused some schedule delays as well. And so despite our best efforts to find efficiencies in the current schedule, um, we have determined that the, the, the schedule and cost plans are need a revision uh, before we can commit to a new startup date. Um, and um, uh, Jim and NWP are working on those. Uh, we hope that we're going to get those in the near future. And uh, you know, in the fall, uh, we're going to be looking at um, uh, uh, announcing a, a new date for startup of operations. Uh, but right now, at this point in time, until we get those revised um, uh, performance baselines uh, from Jim and his folks, uh, it would be premature for us to uh, come out with any additional schedule or any new schedule at this point in time. Uh, so that's pretty much where we stand, the reason behind uh, the schedule slippage. Um, and. Um, uh, I think Jim will have some more information on this, and then we'll go to more questions, right? Because we talk a lot about the performance measurement baseline and, and the, and the uh, management product that, that gets built around the cost, around the schedule, around the thousands of activities, we thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and, uh, and have Jim explain some of the details that go into that. Now, we did a, a workshop back in January when uh, uh, we brought some in some stakeholders and kind of went over the resource loaded schedule that comes out of the PMB. But uh, anyway, we thought it would be good since we are looking at that this piece of the project to, to go ahead and talk about it a little bit. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, so just a reminder, a little bit of, uh, I only have two slides on this, but uh, just as a little bit of a reminder, um, about this time last year, you know, we, we developed our, our schedule and, and the cost associated with recovery. And as Frank mentioned, there were, there were still a number of unknowns uh, coming out of that. The AIB uh, phase two for the RAD event hadn't been issued yet. Um, we were still working through some of the, the unknowns and uncertainties that existed in the underground. Um, and, but but we put, built that schedule about a year or so ago um, and then the workshop uh, that we had, I think was, I think Tim said was in January, where we, we took a number of you that were, were interested through the entire performance measurement baseline, which, which included at the time about, about 404 pages of schedule activities uh, and then the cost associated with that. So the performance uh, measurement baseline, or the PMB, as, as, as you'll hear folks refer to it, is is a document it, it sits in a, a binder that's about well, two binders that are about three inches thick uh, but but what it has in it the elements of this performance measurement baseline is it has the detailed schedule uh, and then associated with that schedule are the resources and the cost um, that correspond to the activities and then and then there are a number of other uh, supporting uh, documents that go along with that cost and schedule, including the risk and opportunities, the priority, the scope, um, and some of the work breakdown structure elements, including the risk and opportunity. So, so when we talk about revising the performance measurement baseline, 
most people will talk about it in terms of revising the schedule and then the associated cost, but there are a number of other activities that go with that. Um, and we're, we're actively engaged in that, that now. In terms of, of that revision, as Frank mentioned, as we, as we look at, at uh, where we are today and what activities need to be completed and compare that to our original schedule, it, it's just not uh, workable anymore. And so we're going we're gonna to update it. Um, we had a team, and I think we mentioned this at the last town hall, we, we brought a team of folks in. We had a little over 30 people that came in, uh, subject matter experts from both NWP, CBFO, headquarters, um, and they, they conducted what's called a lean event, which is an industry uh, term for uh, an efficiency uh, review, basically. Uh, and so that team met for a couple of days. They looked at at our existing schedule, they looked at the, the new scope uh, and some of the issues, performance issues that we've had, and, and they looked at it from the perspective of can't, well, what can we do to accelerate this schedule, what can we do to recover lost schedule time, and, and do we have the right linkages and the right uh, priority in the right order. And so we've got that feedback that's come from that team. We're in the process, as I mentioned, of revising that that performance measurement baseline. Uh, that, that new document is going to have um, a revised detailed schedule with all the remaining activities. For each one of those activities, it'll have the labor and the resources required to, to complete that activity, which then can be translated into cost. Um, and so then we'll run uh, a Monte Carlo calculation on both the cost and the schedule based on the risks that we've identified for each activity, and that'll give us the, um, the management reserve and contingency that we need to, to incorporate into this performance measurement baseline. Um, and then we'll, we'll do a final uh, check on the, the logic ties and the priorities. Uh, and once we've got all that complete, then we'll package that and we'll transmit that back to, uh, to DOE uh, for their review. And so, as Frank mentioned, we're targeting uh, this fall to have that uh, that document revised uh, and approved. So there's a common theme here, which is every time I get up, we stop for questions. So um, I think we're going to do questions again. Yeah, we'll go ahead and, we'll go ahead and take uh, questions um, from uh, the audience here first. Um, and we thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and stop at this point since, uh, you know, we, the recent announcement and, and, and the schedule, uh, you know, it's significant and, uh, and there's a lot of local interest in that. And I'm okay if there's no questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now we hate to disappoint Jim. Somebody come up with something. Um, we have we have anything from the internet, Kyle? Yeah. Okay. A bunch? <laughs> we'll go ahead and go to the internet. Okay, um, and we are all on the topic of, of just recovery. And uh, a couple of these questions are from Mr. Marskinowski. Uh, when do you expect the first shipment of off-site waste to come to rip? Well, again, as both uh, Jim and I had uh, stated, it's, it's premature at this time. Uh, to, to come up with a new estimate until we've got the uh, schedule and cost information that J Jim's preparing right now. So it's, um, it, it's not the appropriate time for us to do that. We'll, we'll uh, be looking to um, uh, have a new schedule this coming fall, uh, but at this point in time, uh, it, it's uh, uh, premature to hazard a guess on that. Okay, and uh, kind of a follow-up, but not really directly related. Uh, when do you expect a permanent RIP manager to be announced? Well, again, we're in, we're in the process of selecting the manager. Uh, it's working its way through the headquarters system, and I'd say, uh, you know, that that's also going to be announced in the near future. But I don't have a definitive date uh, because of you know it, it's in the, the uh, human resource system right now. Okay. Um, last January, there was a workshop um, discussing the, the preparation of the schedules. Um, there were a number of questions asked by stakeholders at that workshop. Did can you t were those stakeholder were those questions brought into the the, the, the program? Were those published anywhere? Did, did, can you get an update on what was done with those? 
Is that your performance meeting? Yeah, it's the meeting. Actually, uh, I don't think Dana was at the workshop. I was at the workshop, um, and I don't, I don't recall any outstanding questions that didn't get addressed uh, or that would need to be rolled into our planning this time. Uh, if, uh, if somebody has specific questions, uh, please feel free to forward them to us. That's all for this topic. All right. Okay, I think we're, we'll go on and uh, we'll go on to recovery now. Okay. So I'm just curious, Jim, when do you think you will have your activities wrapped up and be able to transfer the information to the DOE? So I thought I was going to escape with no questions, so thank you for that. Um, we're, we are uh, we're aggressively working to have something done uh, by the end of August. And that's just NWP's part of the action. And then it'll have to go through a formal review and approval comment period. Uh, but we're, we're shooting for the end of August to have our initial documents over to CBFO. Okay. okay. Before we go into um, uh, the, the recovery status uh, part of the presentation tonight, I wanted to mention that uh, almost every month we get a lot of questions about radioactivity, about contamination, about how surveys get done, a lot of, a lot of uh, external questions both on the internet and even locally about that. Um, so uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is uh, trying to find a, a good way to answer a lot of those questions. So next month for the, uh, for the September Town Hall, we're actually going to have one of our uh, subject matter, matter experts from the site come in and we're going to do a, a, what we're calling a, a RAD 101 right now and try to provide uh, you know, answers to questions, background, how we, how we do business, and really kind of what our objectives are in terms of uh, radiation safety and, and the radiological recovery of the underground. So um, if you don't get your questions answered this week, I think you, you know, want to make sure that everybody tunes in next month because it's going to be a good program. All right, with that, we'll turn it over to uh, Deputy Manager uh, Dana Bryson. So Frank did a good job of identifying a list of uh, accomplishments that have been made um, in the last several months. But recently, we've, we've had some, some key things that um, we've been addressing. One of them has been interim ventilation system. And um, as was mentioned, we, we had some repairs that had to be made. Um, we're completing those repairs and expect the uh, system to ship to the site this month for installation next month. Another key item is the hybrid bolter. So bolting is key to maintaining ground control on the underground and um, you know, um, maintaining the stability uh, the back or, or the roof of the mine. And that's been a major effort that we've been undertaking since we got back into the mine. And we're limited by ventilation. So our, our bolters are diesel powered. You need to have ventilation flow to safely operate a diesel engine. So um, early on, we ordered a hybrid bolter, which is a diesel electric operating bolter. And uh, that's been received on the site. It was disassembled and taken in pieces into the underground. And it's been reassembled in the underground. And we expect that to be operating later this month. Um, of course, with any piece of equipment, you need people to operate it. And that's, that's a, uh, a pretty uh, specific qualification. So additional people have been brought on board and trained in that. So we will have a third crew uh, operating bolting uh, later this month. And, and that, that's really a big deal because that, that helps us catch up on the bolting that wasn't done uh, when we weren't in the underground and allows us to make the mine safer. A uh, third item I wanted to talk about was a fire protection workshop 
that is probably wrapping up right now. Uh, we've had experts from headquarters and NWP. Uh, we've had MSHA experts, uh, NFPA experts. Um, and anyway, they, they've been um, discussing the full range of requirements. Um, we, we are, are unique in that we combine all of these requirements being both a mine as well as a nuclear facility. And so um, that, that workshop, I was there today, Jim was there today. Um, it's, it's doing a good job of wrapping up those requirements and how we're going to address them and um, really uh, assure that, that we are safer in the future. Uh, both for preventing fires, as well as if we have a fire, being able to uh, respond to it um, and, and uh, protect people and the facility. So um, I believe Jim's going to go into more depth on some of these issues. And uh, so I'll turn it over to Jim. Okay, any questions for Dana? <laughs> no, we're saving the questions till after Jim stops. <laughs> told, told you there was a theme going on here. Okay, um, so let me give you the recovery status, uh, and a lot of this is, uh, you know, this is just updating information that we've talked about in the past. But, uh, but again, as uh, both Frank and and Dana mentioned, there's there's still an awful lot of great work going on, and progress is uh, is moving along very nicely. Uh, let me let me talk very briefly about the interim ventilation system, and and I'll just remind everybody, uh, you know, we we've talked about this system for a couple of months. Uh, we went through that period where we did the high fives and we're all happy that the units had showed up. And then the following week, we, we were disappointed when we took the tarps off, did the receipt inspections, and found that uh, during, during transport, the systems weren't properly secured and, and there was some damage. Uh, we then immediately started into our recovery phases. We talked to you about that. Um, we had the systems taken off site. Uh, they were taken um, here in town to a local establishment and uh, and we started the methodical process of disassembly, inspection, identification of the damaged items, uh, and then put together a, a detailed repair plan um, and have started the execution of that plan. So where we are today is uh, many of the repairs have been completed. We have one, uh, one last item that uh, that we need to work through in terms of a repair. Uh, and we expect to do that next week. And then we've got uh, much of the factory acceptance testing that was done at the manufacturer's uh, location prior to shipment. Uh, we've repeated much of that uh, satisfactorily um, and, have, and have verified that we meet the, the, uh, the procurement requirements that initially had been established for this equipment. Uh, we will have to finish this last repair, and then there will be some additional uh, testing that we'll perform uh, before we'll be able to finalize the documentation. And once that documentation has been completed, then as, as Dana mentioned, we'll move the two units, uh, the two fan and filter units, back to the site. And that's, uh, that'll happen uh, sometime in August. Uh, in addition to the fan and filter units, we've got duct work. Uh, I think there's 31 pieces of duct. Uh, that uh, support this system. Um, and I mentioned to you in previous meetings that there were some questions about the workmanship of some of, that, some of those welds on, on that equipment. Uh, the manufacturer took, took all that duct work back, has done their own inspections, have brought in a number of QA experts and weld experts from around the country. They've, they've done a very thorough inspection. They've identified a few wells that did need to be reworked. And they've started uh, to rework um, those those uh, questionable welds, and so again, that's something that uh, uh, many of those components will be will be complete uh, in terms of their rework and their inspections and testings next week, and then the balance will be completed um, between uh, August and September, and all those will eventually be shipped back to the site. Uh, the electrical system. That, that goes with the fan and filter units, the interim ventilation systems, is also uh, has done its factory acceptance testing at the manufacturer, and, and we expect to receive 
uh, that unit on site uh, before the end of the month. And then the civil engineering work, I think we talked about this last month. Uh, we showed you some of the pictures. These are just some additional pictures of some of the, uh, the groundwork that has been done in preparation for both the fan and filter units as well as all of the, uh, in the lower picture, you can see one of the pads that we constructed. This is to, uh, to hold the bracing for the ductwork that will be eventually used to tie this system in. So all that, uh, all that concrete work has been completed and all the final grading and cleanup has been completed. And now the, uh, the next step is to assemble the different components on the site and then start the installation, as Dana talked about, uh, starting in September. In terms of the supplemental ventilation system, uh, I gave you an update on this as well. The equipment had been received on site. We did the receipt inspections. Um, all the equipment arrived safely without, without any damage. Um, we have been working in parallel for several months uh, to put in a new um, substation in the underground, uh, substation four. And uh, the vendor is, is complete with the installation, is now going through his, his uh, punch list items uh, to finalize that, that uh, system and be able to bring it up. We need that system not only to support the supplemental ventilation system, we also need it to support some of the redundancy in the underground in terms of electrical supplies. But that's moving along well. Uh, we had to remove one of the bulkheads uh, in the vicinity of where this uh, unit will be located, bulkhead 402. Uh, we've taken that bulkhead down. We've, we've uh, cut it into pieces. And we've started the removal of that uh, bulkhead from the underground. Finally, this week, uh, as you can see, those units are fairly large. And uh, when you put them on a, on a forklift and start to move them down uh, from the waste hoist to their final location over by the air intake shaft. There's a number of drifts that we have to go down, a number of turns we have to make. And the last thing we want to do is get one of these stuck. So we took down a mock-up uh, earlier this week that uh, represented the largest component. I uh, put it on a forklift. We drove it through the route just to make sure that, uh, that all of our measurements were correct and that we were going to be able to have, move these systems without get, any issues. And so that was completed successfully. So supplemental ventilation system, it'll start, we'll start downloading the actual components uh, later this month and then look to bring it, uh, uh, in terms of its installation, have that complete uh, early this fall. Okay, in terms of the hybrid bolter, uh, Dana talked about this, uh, and I, we briefed it several times before in, in the town halls. This is a, this is a big change for... Uh, the WIC facility, and that previously we've used all, all diesel equipment, um, and, and as most of you know, the diesel equipment challenges now are limited ventilation uh, for worker safety, and so uh, we started down the process of replacing diesel equipment with electric equipment, and so we went out, we did find a hybrid bolter, both, both diesel and electric. Uh, we purchased that. We got it on site. It was a long lead item. It took them several months to assemble it at the manufacturer's shop. They shipped it to us. We, this picture is on the surface, um, and it is, it is the disassembled uh, hybrid bolter. We've taken all these components into the underground. We've reassembled it, and we've had the fire suppression system uh, reinstalled and checked by, by our vendor. So that work is, uh, is progressing well. Um, and again, we're excited about this because what this does is allows us to double the, the bolting capacity in the underground without putting any additional burden on the ventilation system. So uh, we're looking forward to this helping us uh, further accelerate uh, the safety conditions in the underground. Now, in regards to how we've been doing in terms of bolting, just as a reminder, all of the green on this map indicates areas where we have completed catch-up bolting. So we've gone into these areas, we've replaced all the failed bolts in these areas, and all these areas are under our, under our standard routine maintenance now. So as, as anything fails in these areas, we, we replace it uh, real time. The orange areas that you can see on the map are still the areas that we need to get to. And then it's, I know it's a little difficult perhaps on this map, but the hashed areas, hashed orange areas are the areas that uh, that we've identified and we've put some further restrictions on those 
in terms of personnel access, basically only qualified people, only ground control people, bolters, can go into this area uh, simply because uh, we're starting to challenge the safety uh, conservatism that we have in terms of the number of bolts that have failed in these areas. So as you can see, we uh, previously the, the East 140 drift in this area and the, uh, the East 300 drift in this area here and then all the cross drifts here. Those were previously all orange hatched areas that uh, we had identified as, as needing restrictions, but the team has moved in now and they've, they've uh, done a great job in recovering those areas. We're currently working in the East 300 drift and we're working, uh, working our way back to the north. So we're up here, and we're moving our way back to this intersection uh, and then we're going to start uh, moving um, west to east in some of the the uh, side drifts in this area and in this area to again uh, restore safety systems and just as a reminder we've got one electrical substation uh, in the underground that we have out of the six now we have a new one so we've got seven but uh, one of those we have not been able to get to to do all of the uh, electrical checks that we've, we've talked about with the arc flashing in the past I haven't been able to get to that because of the bolting. Uh, that, that sits in this side drift right there. And so uh, the bolting teams are now working their way towards that area uh, so that we can complete the electrical inspections uh, in the underground. So again, they're making good progress. And uh, with the hybrid bolter coming online, we expect to, to accelerate that. The caution that I give everybody is, you know, this is uh, unfortunately work against time. Some of the areas that we got to very early on in November when we started bolting had minimal loss of bolts, but bolting that we had to catch up on. And so we were able to make very fast, very rapid progress in those areas. Uh, now we're moving into areas where obviously have taken longer for us to get there. Uh, more bolts have failed. And so the effort to recover those remaining orange areas could easily surpass the effort that we've already done to recover the green area. So uh, we, we, we say we've recovered about 80% of the area by, by area. It could take us just as long to recover that remaining 20% as it did, took us to get that initial 80. So the teams still have a lot of work in front of them. And so the hybrid bolter is going to help expedite that. And we're looking forward to that. In terms of uh, radiological postings, uh, we've used this map several times um, uh, to give folks an idea of, in general, what the conditions are in different areas. Uh, and I'll just remind everybody, the, uh, the orange areas on this map depict areas that we've, we've posted as controlled areas. These are areas that our radiological control teams have gone in. They've done surveys. They've verified that we're less than uh, 20 uh, DPRIM alpha and they've downposted those areas to controlled areas. What that means is there's no radiological protection required in those areas. The, uh, the sort of light blue uh, colored areas are areas that are identified as contamination areas and airborne radioactivity areas. And what that means is that uh, we found some activity in those areas, it's above 20, D per m alpha, but it's less than 2,000 D per m alpha. And, and the team is required to wear radiological protective equipment, including respirators or, or positive air uh, provided respirators. They have to wear that ensemble in those areas anytime uh, they move into those areas. And that obviously has an impact on efficiency. It has an impact on, on uh, individuals' ability to perform work. It has an impact physiologically on people as it introduces the heat stress associated with wearing that, that uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. The red areas are the areas that we have uh, posted as high contamination areas and airborne radiation areas. And in these areas, the, the transferable alpha contamination is greater than 2,000 D per M. Uh, and we've, give, we've shown maps in the past. We've given some data in the past. Um, and so in general, 
those areas can range upwards of 10 to 15,000 deep per M. Um, could spike in some areas, especially in room seven, which has now been closed. Uh, we were getting readings upwards of about 60,000. Most of those areas are, are in, in the two to 5,000 deep per M alpha, but, but they're listed as high contamination they're listed as airborne, and the folks are required to wear two sets of PPE and, and their respiratory protection. So obviously we've been doing a lot of decon. We've talked about that in the past. We've done a lot of decon effort in panel seven. Uh, we've done a lot of surveying in panel seven. Uh, I think that we're gonna be in a position here shortly to, to repost a number of the rooms from high contamination areas to contamination areas. That'll be great from the operator's perspective. And I've talked about the fact that we are gonna put bratis cloth and salt down um, in a specific area of the mine from our existing transition point, which is at the South 1950 East 140. We were gonna lay down a new floor down the East 140 drift, the South 20, uh, 2520 and then down to the entrance of panel seven. Now what's different on this map today is you'll see the green area that's noted. Uh, this week, uh, after we had done some decon operations using the sprayers and after we had sprayed down some of the bulkheads uh, in the area, the RADCON teams went in, did additional surveys, uh, found that we were uh, less than 20, so they downposted that area to a radiological buffer area. Uh, the team has since placed bratis cloth on the floor all the way down where you can see that green area. And as of today, they've placed salt on top of that bratis from South 1950 to just past the 2180 intersection. So from here down to about this area here, they've been able to lay salt. And they'll continue to do that. Uh, and then they'll lay the bratis cloth, as I mentioned, down towards the entrance of panel seven and we'll lay salt on that, and we expect to be able to downpost that area once we've done that. So team, again, is making great progress to reduce the risk and, uh, and subsequently to reduce the contamination levels, which then allows us to reduce the PPE requirements. So good progress, and, and the team is, uh, is continuing to make a, make a huge effort. Okay, with that, I get to stop once again and ask for questions. Okay, any, uh, any in-house questions? Mary. I am looking at my old contamination map. And it's very confusing because you have red areas in panel seven. The whole thing is red now with your new map. And on my old map, half of it is Under 2,000, and half of it is over 2,000. Can I just take a quick look at it, Mary? Sorry. How can that be? March? March of this year. Yeah, so I think if you'll remember... Uh, so what Mary was asking is, is um, at a previous town hall uh, in the March April time frame, uh, again, we were, we were very excited to tell you that we had made great progress in panel seven that was as part of the closure of panel seven. But what we had done was we had gone in and we had washed down the, the backs, the rib, and the floor of, of the entire panel seven area. And we did that three different times. And, and we were doing that in preparation for closing panel, the room seven of panel seven. When we were done with that, uh, we, based on those surveys, which was just of the surface area, so we checked the floor, we checked the back, we checked the ribs, we were below 2,000, and so we, we made the decision to downpost. About a week after we did that, we realized we were premature. What, what we didn't do was we hadn't surveyed all of the equipment that was sitting in those areas. And so, you know, we had moved forklifts in there, we had moved some of the shield plugs had moved in there, some pallets had been moved in, and we hadn't done the survey of that equipment. And so we 
without knowing what the, what the results would be on that equipment, we reposted the area as a high contamination area as a conservative measure. Now, I think what I was telling you tonight is I think that uh, we've completed all the surveys on that equipment now, and we're just running, we're running through the calculations and having it peer reviewed. Uh, all of that that I'm aware of, all that's come back less than 2,000, and we expect to be able to now officially and permanently downpost that area uh, once we've finished all those reviews. So what that was, Mary, was we had checked the area. We hadn't checked the equipment that was sitting in the area. And that was a mistake on our part. And there was about a two or three day period where we had down posted it, but we went back and reposted it back up until we had finished all those surveys. And I think that's, that's the map you're looking at. OK. OK, any more, uh, any more uh, in-house questions? Another one, Mary. I have um, questions about the ventilation. Uh, we have a supplemental ventilation system. We have an interim. Correct. And we also have the original contaminated one that's still sitting in there. Right. So these other two, are they temporary? Or is the interim one supposed to be replacing the contaminated? <laughs> it's just kind of confusing. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm probably going to confuse you more, but, but there are, so, so to be clear, there are four, when we talk about ventilation, we, we actually talk about four different systems. We talk about the existing system, which is the, underground, the UVS, the underground ventilation system. And as you mentioned, parts of that are, are contaminated. The exhaust shaft, I showed you, parts of the exhaust drift up here that are still high contamination areas. That's the existing system. Now all that air is is run through our HEPA systems and so there is, you know, and then we measure on the back end. So we know there's nothing being released from, from the underground through our existing system. But it has limited capacity. It only allows us about 60,000 cubic feet per minute is all we can push through that existing system. The interim ventilation system is designed to, to augment, so it'll tie into the existing system. And what it will do is instead of having two HEPA filter trains, which is what we have today, we'll have four HEPA filter trains and we'll have some additional fans. But it's all going to pull, pull air through the exhaust strip, the same exhaust shaft, same circuit. It'll still exhaust through the existing exhaust system but we'll just have more capacity, more fans running, and more filters running on that unit. That's what the IVS does, and it takes us from 60,000 to about 114,000 cubic feet per minute, all filtered on the existing system. The supplemental ventilation system, that the picture that I showed you, the blue, that system won't be tied into the existing system at all. It will sit by itself in the underground in the area of the uh, auxiliary intake shaft. And what it's going to do is instead of uh, our existing system, um, this system will pull air into the underground and then push it out the salt shaft. Now, we're going to use all of our metal bulkheads that we have in the underground to basically create two separate areas. All of the contamination areas will run through the existing exhaust, shaft, and out through that filtered system, which will be the existing and the IVS together. The rest of the mine, the clean parts of the mine, will isolate those, and those will all run through that supplemental ventilation system. All right, so all the clean air going through that supplemental, all the contaminated air running through the existing system and the new IVS. Those systems are designed, both the IVS and the SVS, are designed uh, to run for approximately 10 years. We have a line item project that we've talked about in here called a permanent ventilation system, and that has with it two line items. One is a line item to build a new shaft, and the second one is to put a new facility on top of that, which would replace all three of those ventilation systems that I just talked about. Okay, but that's, that's the line item project, which could take, I'm just guessing, 
but could take anywhere from five to 10 years to work through that line item process. Right now, I think our schedule shows about 2020. Okay, is that, is that cleared up any? I know, it's, I know there's a lot to it. Okay. Okay, let's go to the internet and see if we have uh, any more questions. Yeah. And I know um, we're going to focus most of our questions um, on recovery, the questions that were asked about recovery. As Tim mentioned earlier, um, some of the radiological issues will be addressed at a future meeting and questions about record availability and, and so forth. Um, there was one that I thought, because it came up here, uh, there was a question on the clarification between 20 and 2,000 DPM, uh, whether those numbers were for removable or total alpha contamination. Could you clarify that one, please? What you're talking about there is removable or loose contamination, and uh, that's per 100 centimeters squared. Um, one question, is there a report that evaluates the physical integrity of the underground barriers that separates the contaminated and uncontaminated areas when the interim ventilation system is operating? Yeah, we, we have a routine um, surveillance and maintenance program that, that inspects the integrity of all of the bulkheads and all of the regulators uh, in the underground on a, on, a freq on a certain frequency, documents uh, anything that may be uh, found, and then if there are any issues found, then, then we just follow our standard process of submitting uh, a request for repair, and then teams go in and make the, make the repairs. But that's a standard routine activity to inspect those items uh, throughout the underground. Uh, I think this one's going to require a, probably a little bit of an explanation before you answer, but it was a, what were the assumptions in performing the Monte Carlo runs and will that, and the usual way will that information be available? But if you can possibly explain what the, what a Monte Carlo run is, I guess. <laughs> feel like I'm talking about rebound again, alpha rebound. Um, yeah, so w very simply, what, what happens is, um, and so let me answer the first part of that question. We haven't done the Monte Carlo uh, calculations yet on, on the revised scheduling costs, but we'll do that as part of the process. But basically what, what happens is uh, we, we identify risks uh, and opportunities that could affect the schedule. And, and you load in to a computer program, you load your schedule activities in, you load their durations, and then what you do is you say, these are additional risks that could impact those activities, and the impact of those activities could range from X to Y. And so the Monte Carlo calculation is just a, it's, it's a database calculation that, that runs the same calculation over and over again, but changes the variables. So the variables, as an example, could be days. And so for an activity, it, it runs a calculation based on a delay of one day. And then it'll run the calculation again based on a delay of two days, and then three days. And it, it continues to run those calculations and then it basically summarizes all that in, into averages and tells you at the end of the process, okay, so if you look at this sequence of events, it has an uncertainty of plus or minus uh, some value, and that's usually expressed in terms of days, or, or dollars. And that's what we use to, to communicate to everybody what our confidence level is in the schedule or the cost estimates that we put together. And that's a, that's a very simplified uh, description of what a Monte Carlo calculation does, but, but at the end of the day, I think that's a pretty close uh, generalization. Something Jim didn't stress that I want to stress is that you're dealing with thousands of activities, and so you're going to have thousands of, of risks uh, that are run through the Monte Carlo analysis, and it's, it's basically a statistical run that is iterative and just uses a lot of computer time, basically. 
Okay, this is uh, kind of a broader question. What's the biggest challenge in your minds before shipments resume and WIP is operational? And then a supplement, do you expect the a administration change to cause any difficulties? You might want to pass that one up as far as I don't know. Now, as has been said, um, we, we've had some adjustments to the scope. We're, we're factoring that into the rebaselining, and we will get a, a schedule uh, that we, we anticipate this fall. Um, there, there really shouldn't be any, any issues beyond that. We, we've got a uh, consistent funding profile laid out. Uh, we'll, we'll adjust it accordingly, and we anticipate being able to uh, talk to this this fall. Tim, did you? Okay. Um, next question. Um, um, uh, have there been any roof falls since the uh, one in panel three? Uh, okay, so. Um, I'm not sure if this is someone that's uh, got insider information or whether whether they're just uh, they've got a good crystal ball. Uh, if you'll remember, uh, several months ago we showed you and talked about the fact that we had uh, a small area where we had a fall, a roof fall, in the vicinity of one of the entrances to one of our panels. Today. Uh, right at that intersection leading into that panel, same general area, um, a, a team of ground control folks was inspecting the area, and when they were in the area, they noticed uh, a chunk of salt on the floor that was about two feet in diameter, and, and they initially declared a roof fall. Now, the, the team that had been in there previously for the previous roof fall had done some work in that area, and they had what we call it as barring down. They had taken uh, metal poles into that area, they had sounded the back and the ribs, and they had used these metal pry bars to remove a bunch of material from the roof and from the, from the ribs. And so when this individual today said, I think we had a roof fall, the other individuals that had been in there back in April and had done this barring down said, no, that's, that's part of the material that we had removed in April, but we haven't been able to get back into that area to, to remove that debris. Now, now, just to make sure there is no confusion, we've got teams going back in tomorrow. The same guys that had done the work earlier in April are going back in tomorrow with the individual that had done the inspection today, and they're going to confirm or, or deny that you know, this is the area where we've done work, this is the material that we had dislodged, or no, this is an entirely new area. But, but all of the folks that were in there in April believe it's simply the material that had been removed from the back earlier, but hadn't been removed from the floor. So we're, we're continuing to look at that, but we don't think we had another roof fall. I'm going to take one more and then take a break. Or <laughs> um, this is a question I, I know we've covered this months ago, but I, I think it's probably a good one to re-explain. If you could explain where the HEPA filters are in this process, what they do, if you could just kind of briefly go over the HEPA process again. So we have high efficiency particulate air filters that can be engaged in our ventilation system. They've been uh, in line with our exhaust from the mine since February uh, 2014. They allow 60,000 cubic foot per minute to flow through them. As Jim said, the uh, interim ventilation will add two additional filter banks to our existing two filter banks. This is all above ground that tie into the system and will almost double the ventilation flow. Um, most, well, pretty much all nuclear facilities have HEPA filter ventilation systems in them. And um, periodically, you have to change the filters out as they, they load up. Uh, we've, we've done 
our pre-filters several times. Okay. Uh, a filter bank will have um, many, many filters in it um, to, to get your, your flow through there in a cross section. But they'll also have different stages. So to date, we've been uh, primarily changing our pre-filters. So. Yeah, I was, I was looking to see if we had any pictures in the presentation that, that we could use for tonight. Probably the closest thing we have is if you look on this picture, and I apologize, it's small, um, but this picture right here, what, what that's showing you, if you'll remember from other pictures that we've used in the past, that, that is the exhaust. So that is the, uh, that's the point where the air uh, exits the facility. Now, in front of that, which is, you can't see, but in front of it, uh, to the back of the picture, is where our 700 series fans are and where air comes out through the exhaust shaft and then runs through uh, the system. Now, we don't operate the 700 series fans anymore. Those are the ones we were operating prior to the events. We, we've shut those down. We bypass the air as it comes out of the underground on this picture as you're looking at it. It goes to the right, it goes into a building that sits just off the, the right-hand side of this picture. In that building is, are these uh, filter units that Dana was referring to. There are two of them side by side, and they have three phases, uh, mod, high efficiency, and then HEPA filters. Uh, and as Dana mentioned, we've been replacing the mods and high efficiencies. We have not had to change the HEPAs because they simply haven't. Uh, received much loading. But, but coming then out of that building, they come through that filter unit and then they go back into that exhaust that you see and exit the facility. So um, we'll, uh, if we need to, we can, we can always add a picture into the next, the next one and we can show the interim ventilation system where it ties in as well. We've used those pictures in the path. Anybody else inside? Any other? All right. We'll take a couple more from the internet, I think, and then we'll try to wrap up. Um, we have a lot on here, so give me one second. Um, it's, everybody's had a lot of questions tonight. I'm trying to get make sure I get a good variety of, of participants. Um, okay, weren't there problems with the earlier Monte Carlo calculations, or did they predict the delays that have now occurred? So our recovery baseline uh, was based on a, a direct flow and didn't have a Monte Carlo uh, risk analysis and contingency built into it. And so um, one of the reasons why we're taking this extra step is so that the date that you see in uh, September will be a, um, a date that has high confidence to it and that the, the workforce can get behind it and that the public can have confidence in. Okay, now let me take one more turn and, and as a reminder, uh, I'm getting some uh, radiological questions, but I think we're going to try to do a big package on that at our, ne at our next meeting. Um, uh, it's just a follow-up question to the, the checking the roof fall to see what happened. If, if, if you could explain a little bit more about how you're going to check that before you go in and after just to, make, you know, to verify what, whether it was, a, whether it was a, a new one or whether it was a, a leftover, if you could maybe go into a little more on that. Let me, let me try the question here. Um, are they documenting with video and photos the work done before they leave the space? Uh, were they, eliminate the need for re-entry by reviewing what was done and what was seen later? Um, I think, let me go back to the map, because um, the, the area where, where this event occurred um, today, or where the, where the material was identified, is at that at East 140, South 2750 uh, intersection. And if you'll notice, that area is not green. 
So what that means is we haven't done the catch-up bolting in that area. So uh, we need to go back into that area, obviously, to do the bolting. And so we'll be returning to that area. We also do uh, weekly inspections of the entire underground, uh, looking for just these types of things. Um, I don't believe we have any images from, from April when the team uh, did the work, but we have we know who the individuals were, and so they're they're the ones that are going to go back in and and uh, and identify whether this is material left over from their work or whether it's new material uh, based on their experience and their their presence in the underground. So uh, all these areas eventually have to be rebolted. I mean, we got to get them recovered, uh, and we'll eventually move into all these areas and return them to green. All these areas also are required to go through a weekly inspection, regardless of whether the bolting's been done or not, uh, just to confirm uh, the, the conditions. And so um, there, there isn't, we, we won't have the ability to, to not enter these areas and do the weekly inspections. Right? But, but we do make sure that the teams that go in are fully, uh, fully equipped, um, that all the safety precautions are followed, and as I mentioned, all these areas that are hashed right now are all restricted to, to a very select group of trained and qualified individuals that can go into these areas. All right, thanks, Jim. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, Kyle indicated we, we have a, a few more questions. Most of them focus on radioactivity or radioactive contamination, and uh, we're going to try to cover that in detail at the, at the next town hall, which will be the uh, the first Thursday in September. Uh, so keep your questions, and uh, and we'll try to get to them at that time. Also, I wanted to mention uh, for anybody looking for additional information, you know, we are on the web at wip.energy.gov. Uh, we we have a toll-free information line at 800-336-9477. And probably most important, at least locally, uh, in, uh, in the situation where we uh, activate uh, the EOC like we did last week, you can follow us on Twitter. We actually have a Twitter feed, and it's uh, at Twitter, uh, at WIP News. So uh, we, we will put uh, updates from the EOC on that Twitter feed. So um, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap. So thank you all for coming out uh, for DOE and the city of Carlsbad. Um, we appreciate the participation and the interest and look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you.